Oh, God, good, you're here. I am so excited. Guess what? Uh, I hope this isn't about your podcast again. Why? Did you finally listen to it? Da 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 The Gloomy Next Door Production. Hello, pups and kittens, and welcome to another fun-filled episode of The Groomer Next Door. I'm your host, Chris Green, and joining us this week is Debbie gross Taraka. Debbie is, by far, the most knowledgeable woman I think I have had the luxury to be able to speak to, who understands mobility, not just in humans, but really understands it in canines. And that really is a massive achievement in itself. She's charismatic, she's a lot of fun to talk to, she's so intelligent, and she makes a conversation just so easy. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to actually move this week's Fact of the Week to tailor her actual clinic. She has Wizard of Paws. And I thought, you know what, that would be perfect. We're going to have some fun facts about the movie Wizard of Oz. Toto, the dog, made more money than Munchkin actors. Margaret Polganini, who portrayed one of the Munchkins in the film, said that she was paid $50 a week to work on Oz in 1939. That was a decent wage for working actors. Trouble was, Dorothy's canine companion was pulling in a whopping $125 a week. That had to make things very uncomfortable on set. Well, by that sound, Debbie is about to enter the podcast studio. So, with that said, please welcome Debbie Gross Taraka to the podcast. Oh, hello. Hold on a sec. Dad, we have a guest on the podcast. All right, this week on the podcast, we are so very lucky to be joined by Debbie Gross Taraka. She is the creator of Wizard of Paws. She is an amazing woman with so much background, and I'm dying to get into it. So thank you very much for being on the podcast. Oh, thank you, Chris, so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. I am thrilled to be able to talk to you. Your backstory is amazing, and before we even got started, I can tell we already have so much in common, especially our love of nutrition. Yes. But I wanted to go with your origin story, how it all began. So tell us yes, all about it. I definitely have a little bit of a, took a, a kind of a different route to get here. So my <laughs> background, I'm actually a human physical therapist. Mm-hmm. So I've always liked the biomechanics, working with people, all that sort of stuff. But I've always loved animals. And um, while I went through physical therapy school, I was always fascinated, how does this apply to an animal, whether it was things from biomechanics to nutrition, and how is this going to, how can we flip it over? And I remember one of my professors saying, Debbie, you know, don't even think about that. No one's ever going to spend that much time on an animal. You know, focus Hmm. on really where you need to be. And I still tease her now almost. You know, 30, 35 years later and say, oh, remember my uh, dream way back when? Well, I'm kind of living it right now. So, um, you know, that's always fun. But I started, I actually lucked out with a great position with the New York City Ballet right out of school and um, learned so much about movement and you know, just working as a physical therapist for um, that organization and looking at everything from if the ballerina is missing a couple degrees of motion in their toe, how much it's going to affect their entire body. Also looking at nutrition, looking at conditioning, looking at their core, all of that sort of stuff. And then I moved out to San Diego. I took a position with a sports medicine group out there, and we were treating the San Diego Chargers and a bunch of other professional teams. And 
a lot of people joked, oh, you came out to the real athletes. And I said, oh, no, I left the real athletes in New York. There's hands down, you know, no comparison. And um, then I came back to the East Coast and my pull for the animals, I kept saying, okay, you know, we can start doing all of this um, for you know, the same thing that we're doing for people, whether it's rehabbing after a post-operative condition, a neurological condition. Um, or just doing a lot of preventative measures. So I slowly started transitioning over from people to primarily dogs, and I founded uh, Wizard of Paws, which is my office, and it's just a great location, a great spot. I love my staff. I love my clients. I love the animals that come in. We see a mix of probably 60 to 70% cases of rehab, And that rehab could be anything from end of life and making their lives a little bit better to returning a police dog to work. And then the other 30% is a lot of uh, uh, performance conditioning, weight loss, just getting their people getting their animals in shape. Um, I'm in New England right now, so we're ready. We're getting ready for the winter. I always like the dogs to go into the winter as strong as possible. Mm-hmm. You know, looking at their condition, just making sure their weight is good, you know, they have enough muscle on because inevitably they're not going to get the exercise that they need as the as the um you know, colder weather sticks in a little bit longer. And it's you know, so I always joke, I'm definitely living the dream. It's incredible and we encompass everything from I've got ballerina, a little bit of loss of range of motion and designing programs to for the individual dogs and, of course, adding in proper nutrition, weight control, proper exercise. And it's all, you know, all a big, I always say it's a big puzzle. We have to put all the pieces of the puzzle together to get a great outcome. I would think that a ballerina and the mechanics of a dog would have a lot of similarities just with the fact of the, being able to be as agile. And I, I, when I saw sports medicine, I was like, oh, okay, this is interesting. But, you know, you said it best. Ballerinas are a lot more agile, and there's a lot more technical movement than in, in sports. That's just the Absolutely. simple thing. Now, of course, you know, the whole idea of nutrition, it's the key. Is nutrition the number one key to a longer life, or is it exercise? Very good question, Chris. I I actually think it's a combination of the two, Um, you know, because certainly eating right, but also being active. And this is something I try to go over with clients just about every single day, (laughs) um, whether they want their dog to lose weight, and I go back to the age-old answer of Increase activity, you know, decrease the bad, um, the bad food that's coming in and get good food on board. Um, so we're always talking about that. And the same thing with like sports performance. You know, we look at what a dog is burning, just whatever sport it is. Um, there's a, a dog that I'm working with right now for um, field trials, and he needs to be running out in the field sometimes two to three hours at a clip. So getting his nutrition on board, making sure he has enough protein and fat in there to sustain him through that, and Mm -hmm. also making sure he does not get injured. I don't think a lot of people realize as well how nutrition plays a key role in that, that if their dog doesn't have the proper nutrients in, you can almost set them up for failure. Mm Mm-hmm. So talk about it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's funny because people will go into the local shelter and they pick up a dog because it is exactly what they want. But they don't realize, hey, there are some dogs that are working dogs. Right. right. And what does a working dog need to do? It needs to go and do something. It can't just sit on the couch all day. It can't eat that dry kibble that's containing just an abundance of sugar and chemicals and carbohydrates. I mean, it is just one of those things. I'm like, okay, think of it this way. See that athlete right there? If they were eating nothing but fast food, would they be an athlete? No. They would just be an obese individual 
barely able to get off the couch. That's what we're doing. Right. And, and, and still, and I know you get this all the time because I get it, and I imagine you get it ten times more, and that's, well, I feed my dog XYZ, which is big commercial dog food company. They think it's, it's well, it's, it's on this, this one show for dogs. I mean, it's a complete mm-hmm. dog show brought to you by these people. Of course it's got to be good. Right. And then you hear the, the whole thing. Well, I know that these people that are in these dog shows, they're feeding their dogs this brand. No, they're mm-hmm. not. Right. It, it's like the agility when it comes to the agility courses for dogs. Those are not something, you know, to be taken lightly. They're a lot of work. Exactly. Exactly. You've got movement in these in these joints that if you're in dry kibble, I don't even know how to put it into words. The muscle deficiency is just breaking down piece by piece. How do you tell people this? How do you inform them that muscular bone density, organ failure, obesity? I mean, we're how how far do I have to go into this? You have to right. tell people, and you go, this is all going on. How do you do it? Right. It's, I, Chris, I, my mom grew up on a farm in Austria, oh. and it was right before World War II, during World War II, and um, when we got our first dog as a child, and, you know, she said, we're not feeding the dog that dog food. Um, mm-hmm. She said, we just, we don't do that. You know, the dogs eat what we eat. And, you know, she said this, and she was absolutely right. You start to look into it. And when was dry dog food formulated? I mean, it was really during World War II when people didn't have money for scraps. So a lesser form of food, if you'll even call it that, was made for these dogs. And I remember her, you know, when I was 10 years old, she said, okay, the dogs need a mix of organ meat, they need vegetables, they need their bone in there, they need this, you know, different sources of protein. And, you know, our first dog was an Alaskan Malamute, and he lived to be 16 years old and never ate an ounce of commercial dog food. And, um, you know, so I always go back to that and think, and it's so true, you know, can a dog really break down things? And, we see so many dogs in the office and when they stay with us, they're boarding with us for either a medical condition or just conditioning. You know, they're getting in shape for a big dog show, say like Westminster, just we had dogs getting ready for Yukonuba. Mm-hmm. And I always know and I try to explain this to owners without getting too crass, but just look at what they're eliminating. It's a lot of elimination that they're not processing because their body just can't handle this stuff. You know, whatever you think is the greatest and latest deal at Petco or one of these other places, they're not processing it. They're not Mm -hmm. getting the nutrients. You know, and I find a lot of owners then pump on the supplements. Well, and I'm a true believer that we should get as much of our nutrients from food as we can. You know, I do love supplements and I think they need to be increased in some dogs, but the basis is what we eat, what the Mm -hmm. animals eat. And, you know, you can definitely tell the animals that are suffering that don't have that. And I think we get sometimes confused with existing versus succeeding. You know, <laughs> so many of these dogs just exist and, you know, they're doing fine on whatever until they're pushed. And then you start to see all these um, other issues start to come up. So, yeah. That's what I love about dry kibble is that. All of these issues lie dormant. And mm-hmm. then, again, like you said, a stress will ignite it. Age will ignite it. There's right. always something. And then all of a sudden, you can have an 8, 9, 10-year-old dog that didn't exhibit any of these issues. And all of a sudden, now it is. And people are like, but he's been on this stuff for 10 years. Exactly, yeah. It's always been a problem. It just yeah. lied dormant. And how do you tell somebody that your dog or even your cat, which I'll tell you, that's an, another kicker for me, is <laughs> the dehydration in cats. I, I think I said to Dr. Koger, I think I think it was, we were joking about it. I said every bag of cat food should come with amoxicillin. 
<laughs> little sample of it because all the cats are going to need it anyway. So, hey, why not? And I just, I look at all this and I, I, I've told this to so many people. I'm like, hey, your cat's dehydrated. No, it's not. It has a full bottle, a full bowl of water. It can't be dehydrated. Oh, boy. Do you want me to explain this to you? <laughs> I mean, it, it's, and yet, we've, we grew up in a time of fast food. Right. Huge time where fast food was in its booming time. It was in its heyday. And ob human obesity was in the rise. Same thing's applying now, but in dogs. It's like, I always say, it's big tobacco and fast food. It, two trains, head-to-head, -head and a collision course. And that's what it is. We're not exercising our dogs, which was just like humans back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. No kids were out playing, and it was all because of the Nintendo. That took right. kids off of the streets and playing. Fast food took away the, the whole thing of sitting down dinners. So the convenience of a fast food meal for the busy parent made all the parents only feed fast food. So no exercise and bad food contributed to obesity and everything that's going wrong with dogs to this day. Where are we now? 17, 18 years later? And we're right back to it, but nobody is caring because they're saying, well, these are pieces of property. And that gets under my skin. Mm -hmm. They're a life. Right. And they exactly. give so much to us. They give more to us than I think the majority of people give to them. I was listening to the Nancy Grace uh, interview, and she had some great people on. She had Jessica Slater. She had Susan Thixton. She had Dar Dr. Becker, Rodney Habib. And I felt like she did such an injustice for this claim unprepared, and completely oblivious to these problems. I think to myself, how is it you can consider yourself a broadcaster and you have no idea what's going on? Right. Shocks me. Shocks me to this day. And, and do you actually see this stuff in mainstream media? No. Nobody's right. talking about it. How is this so untalked about. I know it's not really a word, but it's kind of one of these, I'm always blown away. How is this not a discussion that we're having on a constant basis? Right. Right. It's, you know, and I think as you had said, it's just there. And where I tend to see the problems is a dog will either hit rock bottom or they're close. Mm -hmm. And the same thing, an owner will say, but I've been doing this for so long. And, you know, it, I think, one of my struggles is having, getting an owner to understand, yes, feeding a good food is definitely going to be more expensive, but in the long run, it's going to save you a lot of money because you're not going to deal with as many health issues. I mean, pretty, there are dogs that no matter what you do, they're still going to have some health issues, but I always use the analogy of stacking the cards in their favor. Mm -hmm. You know, so from, a nutritional standpoint, from a fitness standpoint, injury recognition, all of that sort of stuff, we want to make sure that we do as much as possible to, you know, help those, you know, help those dogs. And you're right. I mean, these are living things that just give us their all. Mm -hmm. So, absolutely. And, and, and I'm buying a 50-pound bag for th literally pennies on the dollar. How right. can I avoid that? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I use the analogy, too, would you rather have you know, some fast food burger or would you rather have a great burger from, you know, some expensive steak restaurant that you know is good quality? You know, you just feel so much better after you eat that good quality compared to that fast food. But but the difference is, is one's on the dollar menu and the other is going to cost you $30. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I could eat for a month for that one burger. <laughs> And, yeah, I and you know it's it's weird because we think about this stuff. I mean, when I go to the grocery store, when I pick up a bag of Oreos, I know exactly what I'm going to be putting in my stomach. <laughs> if I pick up carrots, I'll also know, hey, that's going to be good for me. But if I eat Oreos, which I do, I know it's not good for me. But you know, again, like a, I'm pretty sure our dogs 
even our cats, if they could, you know, get out of the window still long enough, they would go outside and they would exercise. If, mm-hmm. if, the, if the cats were indoor, outdoor, they'd be outside chasing mice and garden snakes and who knows what else. Absolutely. And I'm always, movement is life. Yeah. You know, no matter whether it's your six-month-old puppy that has to get going. I'm working with a dog right now, a 14-year-old Bernice Mountain dog that is just, I mean, is definitely hashtag survivor. This dog is got a multitude of malignancies and the owners are just doing everything that they can and you know just getting her up and moving we work on five minutes five times a day and just that movement is great and just keeping you know keeping them going so you know they need to move and you're absolutely right it's us that feel guilty you know we come home we're tired instead of walking the dog we'll give them a treat instead (laughs) <laughs> so we and I tell owners all the time, you know, where we do this, like the dog, some of them can open the cabinet, but you know, for the most part, it's us that's doing that. And you know, it's behavior modification on our point, you know, to help with that. Oh, but here's the even worst part: is that for the unsuspecting pet parent out there who is giving treats that we've all seen all the terrible, mm. terrible treats that have been out there and how harmful they are. And I've even said this one, there is some kind of recalled dog bone or something in some stocking right now. Oh, I'm sure. Uh-huh. And it's it's mm. soon to be given to someone's dog and they don't realize it's a loaded gun. Right. And, yep. and you know, it's it's. I always say, you know, look at the law. Nine-tenths, the law is possession. Mm-hmm. What's inside a bag of dog food? There it is. It's right. as simple as that. And and people just, as you can tell, that's my soapbox. It's. <laughs> I mean, I I literally will go down a big box store aisle. I'll see just this large mass amount of crowd. It looks like Black Friday down the pet food aisle. And, <laughs> oh, it kills me. It it literally it drags into me. My wife has to tell me. Let's keep walking. Right, right. I no, but it's it. so, I mean, you have a child. I have children, and I always tell them, okay, look at this. Like, one, that bag of Cheetos will probably last for the next 500 years. <laughs> you know, that is not good for you. Yeah. And that color does not exist anywhere in nature. <laughs> you know, so if you can't understand the ingredients, it's not good for you. Your body can't understand them either. And I always talk with owners about that too. You know, do you really understand what this is in your dog food? Can you break it down? And if they can't, I just switch that analogy to them. You know, would you feed your children this? Would you eat this? And honestly, because some of them don't care. Yeah. <laughs> they don't care what they're digesting. So I'm, that's just a battle that I'm not going to win. And others, you know, do really care. So. But when they come to you for that advice and then you give it to them and they're checked out, Seconds after, yeah. oh God, oh my God, I don't know how to, I don't know how to respond. I never do. I, I, it's, <laughs> I like silently go and I bang my head up against the wall and say, okay, we're done. And you know, some people you're going to help and you're going to do amazing things with, and other people are going to stick with what they believe is true, and that's their option. You know, it, it's tough. Very true. It's very true. I mean, the difference is, is that if we eat a bag of Cheetos, in moderation for a human's anatomy, it can actually be okay. Everything right. in moderation right. works okay for us. Absolutely. It doesn't work that way with a dog. I mean, right. their breakdown is so strategic. I mean, you take you take kibble and look at how much exits. Take a raw feed diet. And look at how much exits. One is firm. One is compact, which is the raw. And then you get this big pile of I don't know what the heck to call it. And it's not firm. What seems more healthy? You know, that's, that's really the simple logistics of it all is let's study poop. And which sounds ridiculous, but anybody who knows this stuff understands the poop is Really, the evidence. There's your science. Correct. Why that doesn't get to people, I don't know. But yeah. 
It doesn't. So that brings me to my next question. <laughs> what is your soapbox moment? Mm, my soapbox moment. I think I have, you know, definitely just like you, I have a lot of people coming to me for advice and probably one of my most recent <laughs> soapbox moments is, um, ball play, ball playing. And I see more injuries from owners going outside, drinking their cup of coffee, throwing a ball for their dog 15 to 20 times, and they tire their dog out, And but then their dog is injured. And they don't understand, well, why, you know, why can't I keep doing this? Because you're injuring your dog. We would not do that to a person, say, okay, let's just go outside, I'm all excited, and throw a ball, and I'll run 15 times as fast as I can without warming up, stretching, the dog's going to be overweight, and then throw in a lameness, and I, I get this all the time, well, my dog would die if I can't throw a ball for them. Mm. There's so many other things to do, and not that ball playing is all bad, but I always say, please think before throwing. You know, you should not be taking an overweight Labrador just because they're ball crazy and tossing a ball 10 times in the slippery ice because they will get injured. And, you know, giving owners options and saying, well, how about taking them for a walk? I can't do that. Oh, why? Because I don't <laughs> you know, It's just so much easier. And that's like one of my most recent things is you just, you can't do that. And people tend to blame so many other things on injuries where, you know, a simple just tossing a frisbee or tossing a ball is creating this. And then it's compounded by just lack of fitness. Mm -hmm. And the, the animals don't have it. They're not eating well. They don't have those proper stores to deal with that explosive plyometric activity. And then they get injured. And it just becomes this roundabout, you know, continuous downward spiral and just doesn't work well. And it goes back to sports medicine, though. That's mm -hmm. where that all starts. Because, again, exactly. you understand this. Now, even at my daughter at nine, she should, she's right at that cusp where now you're going to have to start stretching. Right, right. Ten years old, that's a guarantee. You better start stretching then. Right now, it's yeah. still a rubber band. Anything <laughs> past this, it's not. So you can look at a puppy and go, rubber band. Still, you don't want to overstretch it. But hello, and then I'm just thinking when you said Labrador, and I'm just thinking, I'm thinking every kind of dog. But I'm like, and the bigger the dog, you're looking at blowing out their legs, you're looking oh, out exactly. hip dysplasia. I mean, it's it's crazy for just throwing a ball. And you yeah. said it, warm them up, warm them up by taking a exactly. walk. Exactly, oh. exactly, and something so simple and. You know, just, and that can cause more harm, but we'll look at everything else. We'll look at all these other things, but that's it. It's that simple thing. And, you know, I, no matter what, we're all athletes to some point, and so are our animals. You know, so we look at them and they should be treated, you know, as such from every, you know, every standpoint from warming up, from conditioning, from their weight to nutrition, you know, everything like that. And it's, it is, you know, like I, I laugh as I'm coming on, onto a monumental birthday. <laughs> you know, I definitely don't bounce back, you know, as quickly. And you know, we see that in animals as well. They definitely don't bounce back as quickly. But there's so many things that we could do to make that better. And yet, it's just easier to throw a ball to a cold yeah. dog. And, yeah. and when I say cold, I mean muscles are not. They're not stretched. They're not fully expanded. Exactly. I, and, oh my God! I just I can think. I, can you imagine going for a run and yeah, you don't I, limber up? Yeah, and I never. When someone comes in, they I ask them what they do with their dogs for activity, and they say, "Oh, I let them out in the backyard." I don't count that. And I often joke that dogs that live in the city are in much better shape than dogs that live in the country. I agree. Because you know we let them outside, and one dog could do fence running, which is a whole other issue. Another dog could be laying under a tree, but they're not getting any purposeful movement. So actually taking the dog for a walk, something so simple and so great for both the owner and the dog, you know, has so many benefits. Have you ever noticed the difference? Now, I've always had indoor cats. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking about everything you're saying. And I'm thinking, I've, for the first time we have a rescue that's an indoor, it has to be an indoor-outdoor cat. 
and I look at this outdoor cat when it goes out and it's playing with garden snakes or even catches mice. You look at the physicality of that of that cat, and you think to yourself, this cat is the epitome of fully stretched out, good temperament, uh, probably healthier than any household cat because it's out running and jumping and playing. And I looked at that, and as you're talking, I'm going, no wonder so many house cats are just so overweight and lethargic. Exactly. Yeah, and they're definitely they're overweight. They're, you know, I tease and call them the silent sufferers yeah. because most people, you know, if they're they're hurting, they'll go upstairs or they start to get overweight, and no one really pays attention to them, you know. And absolutely, but and you can't. they're cats, they can't. cats, dogs, cats. Right. It's showing signs of weakness. They can't exactly. do that. Right. Yeah. Right. Oh my gosh, that's rough. So. <laughs> Let's go into treatment because I mean we'll stay in nutrition the whole time, and I, I <laughs> as you can tell, I can get lost in this in this different topic. But <laughs> I'm really interested in treatment. So mm-hmm. when you start your assessment, so let's just say I bring my Akita in. How do you start your assessments? So we do a lot of different things. First is definitely a good history, and again, getting back to that puzzle, like I'll always finding out what the dog needs and what the owner needs is again like putting all the pieces of the puzzle together and we start with a very thorough history on anything from you know maybe your Akita isn't jumping into the back of your SUV anymore Um, you know which usually indicates a sign of hip weakness could be back pain Um, then we run a lot of different uh, tests we have a dynamic gait analysis which is great to show um, how much pressure a dog is being putting on each leg and looking at their stride length. Um, So we'll usually do that on most dogs. We also have this really cool piece of equipment called a digital thermal imaging that lets us look at the temperature of the dog's body, their physiological temperature. So typically heat will show up as red. Mm -hmm. And so any kind of inflammatory condition and blues will show as lack of circulation so it could be you know just a myriad of things causing something that's cool yeah it is really cool it's and it's so neat for owners to see too and then we'll look at um of course do a complete physical you know finding out what the dog their functional just decreases or deficiencies whether it's they can't sit correctly because their hip or knee hurts Mm-hmm. Or they can't take a turn on agility at not really 60 miles an hour, but very fast. <laughs> you know, can't take a turn as well to the right as they can to the left. So really breaking down, you know, everything that's going on. And I always um, tell my owners, I tell my, my staff, every dog is an individual. So mm-hmm. no, no one has the same injury at all. There's always different reasons for things occurring. So, you know, why does that dog have that particular injury? And then what are our sets of goals? So what do we need to do to get that dog back to the goal, if possible? And how are we going to break it down? And I always like to break things down to short-term goals. So this is what we would like to accomplish within two to three weeks. And then what is our long-term goal? And, you know, of course, long-term goal is going to be, you know, whether it's just walking you know, to get outside, to eliminate, or to, you know, take those turns on the agility course in both directions. And um, so, you know, that starts our evaluation. And then we really determine our treatments from there, what's going to work best. We do anything from joint mobilization, manual therapy, lots of stretching. We have underwater treadmills. Um, I started a company with a business partner called Total Fit on all uh, fitness equipment that's phthalate free, it's burst resistant, latex free. So every dog gets core work, just working just like us with, I'm sure many people have back pain. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And once you do your exercises, the back pain goes away. So just working on that strength and things like that make a huge difference. And we have land treadmills, underwater treadmills, do lots of creative things as well. So lots of fun stuff. Just sounds like a lot of fun to be part of. 
It is. <laughs> I mean, I, I work with dogs all day and sometimes cats, but it's not as fun. That's, <laughs> I just wash them. I mean, you get to actually work out with them. That, that's, <laughs> that's actually much better. Um, you know, I, as I'm thinking about them, I'm thinking about the water treadmill. And I remember when I saw that for the first time, I thought to myself, how does that even work? But you think the resistance of the water and then you realize just what it's doing. And that's, again, here we go back to sports medicine. That's where it all came from, if I'm not mistaken. Exactly. And, you know, the water is so great for so many, just the properties of water. Um, there's so many great things to do with it. And, you know, whether it's resistance, um, we know from studies that walking in water burns three times as many calories mm -hmm. as walking on land. So it's a great jump start to a weight loss program. For arthritic dogs, it helps relieve the pressure on their um, joints. You know, for sports med dogs, just working in that water, I know if they run in the underwater treadmill for a half hour, that's equivalent to 90 minutes on land. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just, you know, when you look at all of that, you look at their, their sports medicine, and it's just pretty awesome. So Now, I read one time, and, and again, it's, this is about 10 plus years ago, that running on concrete was bad for knees. So that's, I think, where the whole idea of water treadmill that was softer on the knees, actually on the, the muscles and on the joints. And that's why they said, don't run on, on ground. You want to run in something softer and then the resistance that would all play itself into be a multitude of possibilities. Is that actually true that running can damage your knees? It could. It definitely, um, first, most of people and most dogs are not stored starting out with an orth orthopedically sound body. Right. <laughs> so, you know, you take any abnormalities and then you have them running on hard pavement, it definitely starts to cause some more issues. And if you throw an ex extra pound in there, mm. you know, it'll definitely cause more. So I always recommend if people do want to run with their dog to find a better surface. Um, you know, I definitely want to get them out and about, but just, if the hard pavement is the only thing that they have, just to do that in moderation. So, Yeah, I thought that was a weird one. I thought that was so yeah. strange. I was like, wow, it tears up your knee, huh? Well, okay. Yeah. So what's the most common treatment? Um, we do probably, I mean, every dog gets some sort of core work. Um, we do a lot of laser or photobiomodulation, whether to um, decrease inflammation or decrease pain, increase blood flow, that sort of stuff. Um, so, and we use that for very arthritic dogs or dogs that were doing, um, preventative measures. And so I just wrote a couple of chapters in a textbook on photobiomodulation for, uh, decreasing the amount of injuries in a dog. So, um, you know, so a lot of the dogs do get laser and, then their core work. Those are probably the two, you know, key things that we work on and, you know, everything else is kind of added in. So interesting. I'm not, I'm, I'm sitting here just going, man, I always say I'm the first, <laughs> the very first listener to every episode. And I'm, I feel always <laughs> lucky for that reason. <laughs> um, and I'm just going, man, that sounds like so much fun to do. That's just, just the, the, the study of it alone just sounds like fun. Yeah. Wow. So now, of course, you know, like I mentioned, I have an Akita, and hip dysplasia is very common in that particular breed, which scares the crud out of me. Yeah. And one thing that was funny is you had mentioned um, not being able to jump into the SUV. Um, as far as even jumping up on the couch or bed, back before I actually was a raw feeder, I was just like everybody else. I did the same little sauna dance and drive, you know, kibble. Didn't know any better. And my dog was completely just, eh, I'm here. Lethargic yeah, at some existing. point. Yeah, yeah, gray. That's, I always say the color gray because it was there. Did it bark? No alertness, no playfulness. Would not jump on couches, bed, whatever. Cause we're one of those people. We're like, hey, you know what? Come up here with us. Right. Now, of course, now she's, you know, raw fed. She does everything. She jumps up into the car. She'll jump on the bed, the couch. She barks. She's alert. 
But I also know hip dysplasia is definitely still something I have to worry about because, unfortunately, we did feed Kimble, and, of course, there's no guarantee that she wouldn't, even on full raw the whole time, there's no guarantee that she wouldn't have hip dysplasia. So how do you treat dogs with these issues? So with, you know, for things like that, so hip dysplasia, one of the keys is what's called the multimodal approach. So we definitely want to always make sure the dog is not in pain, um, which is like one of the first key things. So because if the dog is in pain, if we're in pain, the muscles are not going to function as well. Right. So I always ask that we make sure that there's no pain um, anywhere. And you know, sometimes with like cases like hip dysplasia, there's some mild pain, and the you know it could be treated. Sometimes um, um, just with like a heat pack or laser or something like that, and the um, you know, or just at home, like some massage, that sort of stuff. But then it's really to build stability because when we look at whether it's hip dysplasia or elbow dysplasia, mm-hmm. it's um, you can hear my dogs barking <laughs> in the background. <laughs> um, it's really just a looseness. So there's the dogs need some more stability. So we'll begin by with low level balance exercises and things like that that are really beneficial. But it's always that multimodal approach, making sure there's no pain or anything like that. Hmm. That's always my fear. As you can tell, that that's my biggest fear. She yeah. hasn't had nine had eight. She hasn't shown it, but it's still always going to be my fear because it's so common in any big dog. I think one of the dog, one of the breeds that scares me the most is Great Danes. Oh, just yes. <laughs> a large amount of issues, and oh my gosh, I we we see them come in all the time, and I know they're dry kibble fed, and you can just imagine how that just breaks me down, top to bottom. I'm just lose my mind. Yeah. <laughs> so now, of course, you're absolutely brilliant when it comes to the anatomy. You've done so much. But you know what? We're just pretty much scratching the surface. You've also, you've also authored multiple chapters in veterinary textbooks. Now, yes. that's interesting. Please explain <laughs> how that worked out and, in a sense, kind of dumb it down for people like me. What were they <laughs> on? What was the subject matter? Because, as you can tell, I kind of geek out over this stuff. <laughs> So there's, yeah, there's been um, quite a few just written on different topics on, I had mentioned laser photobiomodulation and looking at sports medicine and things like that, Um, but also on joint mobilization when I was talking about that ballerina and looking at the tiny bit of movement, you know, that if they're lacking that, you know, how can we make that better? And you know, so for a dog, if they're not, uh, if they don't have enough elbow extension, let's say, or like your Akita, have enough hip extension, then they're going to start to compensate elsewhere. And I always use the analogy, if you have a pebble in your shoe, mm-hmm. you're going to throw your, you know, body off a little bit and your back may start to bother you and, you know, maybe your hip and your knee. So with a dog, if they don't have enough mobility, in one area, they're going to start to feel it. So I wrote a book and many chapters on joint mobilization and really looking at the specific, um, you know, needs and how to help, you know, with that. Um, I'm trying to think of lots on, you know, sports medicine and osteoarthritis. And, you know, I always, my, our goal in our clinic is always the best quality of life for the longest time possible. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, whether, whatever, you know, we could do, you know, because people may say, oh, you know, my dog wants to hunt. I don't know if that's such a good thing. Well, if that's what they were bred to do and that's going to give them a good quality of life, then that's going to be our goal. You know, some dogs, like you talked about, you know, just want to hang out on the couch. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And if that gives them a good quality of life and they're in okay shape, well, that's okay. (laughs) And, you know, you look at, it's it's funny because I'll watch a show called Locked Up. I don't know why I'm obsessed. I think it's the stories. That's what what came to 
to fruition was that we were ta- I was talking to somebody and they're like, you know what, uh, you like that show because you, you're always chasing stories and you want to know the story behind all these people and you want to get into their heads. And there was this one episode and, and my wife and I were watching it and there's a, a two prisoners that were loose and of course right away there's dogs and that excited me. And I'm looking, I'm going, ooh, bloodhound, oh, cool. And I'm thinking to myself, well, here's a dog that needs to be out there. And then there was a Malmois. I'm like, oh, of course. What better of, of a dog to actually, you know, apprehend than a Malmois or a German Shepherd? So you got your tracker and you got your hunter. And I look at these dogs and I think to myself, and yet there's somebody right now who has each one of these dogs that are just laying on a couch eating dry kibble and Absolutely. completely not where they're supposed to be. Here's two of the the best working dogs. And, yeah, it just doesn't make sense to me. throws me off. <laughs> Sometimes I, I'm sure you do this, too. I, I look at owners and I look at dogs and I think, why the heck did you get this dog? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, what were, what were you thinking here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that does happen quite a lot. Or you'll hear about it at a shelter where somebody will, you know, adopt a dog because it's really cute. But this dog is very energetic and needs to be out there. And they don't have that lifestyle. They're probably at work or they're at school or whatever the case may be. And you're just, they don't have the time to devote to that type of dog. Exactly. Exactly. And yeah, playing, then the dog doesn't get the activity. Mm -hmm. They're not being fed well. So it just starts with this whole, you know, big thing. So absolutely. And, you know, we already have, you know, these loved ones that are, in diminished type lifestyle their their lifespan is diminished for every year seven years for a dog right. and you think to yourself and then we factor in poor nutrition that's yeah. going to take away years that's going to take away so many di- different parts of quality of life i don't understand how this is not such an issue. Why we're we're just overlooking it? It it shocks me. Which I've I've gone astray from my my whole point of authoring these multiple chapters in veterinary textbooks. Um, my other question I had with that is, how do you actually sit down to write these? Because I've always wanted to ask that question. How did you <laughs> find that ability to? Okay, I'm going to write it. Here I studied these books at one time and. Now my work is going in there. How did you put everything into perspective and articulate everything that you wanted to say into this actual chapter or chapters? You know, a lot of times I'll look and what has prompted me to look for or to write is actually seeking some knowledge and I can't find it. Yeah. So then I decide, well, you know what, then I'm going to write it. So I'm going to sit down and I'm going to do it because if I'm looking for it, someone else should be looking for it as well. So I, you know, usually start with that. (laughs) Then sitting down to get it all done will be a struggle sometimes, (laughs) but a good struggle. (laughs) Yeah. I would imagine it would be a good struggle. Good, good problem to have. (laughs) Now, Of course, like I said, we were only scratching the surface at your origin story. And, you know, it wasn't like you haven't done a variety of different things. But now we're actually going to go into the fact that you produced four DVDs. Mm -hmm. Strengthening the performance dog, stretching the performance dog, osteoarthritis, and your dog, which I imagine would be probably one of the more common ones and probably the best one of all of them. Boy, that's got to be the number one thing, I would imagine. And get on the ball, too. Yeah. I enjoyed that part. <laughs> now, I, I don't even know where to start with the how did, you know, the idea of making one come about. What were the struggles? What was the influence? What gauged you to do this? And what's next on, you know, is there a fifth one? Is there what's going on from there? Yeah, so there's definitely, there's things in the works right now um, with my Toto Fit company. We're working on more education and it really prompted from that because, again, owners were asking, you know, what can I do to keep my dog in shape? Like, 
for you. Like, you know, you have an Akita, you have a big dog. What could you do proactively to keep your dog in shape? So all those DVDs kind of stemmed from that. Like, let's put something out there that will help, you know, animals and, you know, get them out there more. So... I just, I look at that and I go, my gosh, how amazing. And, and you know, it's funny. It's, I, I have a pit and I have a chihuahua. And I, I honestly think the chihuahua might be the most active of all of them, which makes me laugh the most. <laughs> yeah. She's just, she's just a, a mile an hour. She's the oldest one of all of them. And yet she's just happy as you can imagine. She's, <laughs> she's more of a cat than a dog. And that, <laughs> what does that tell you? Uh, I had to ask before you forgot. I didn't, I, didn't write it down, and I wanted to actually ask about the duck. The, oh, yeah. <laughs> that was an interesting story. I meant to ask back when we were talking about soapbox, and you were talking about different things, and I was going to ask then. I, I saw the story about a duck, and I think, didn't it get in a fight with a badger? Yeah, it was actually, and it's been so cool. Um, and, I mean, fortunately, she lived. She was okay. She got attacked by a weasel. Weasel. And was, yeah, the only one to make it. And um, so we treated the wounds, but then we started to realize she doesn't have enough motion in her neck to go down and get the food. Hmm. So um, we've been working on, and how do you get a duck to stretch? <laughs> you know, because working and she's not was not food motivated because it hurt her to go down and actually get the food so just kind of I always love thinking outside the box so working on okay problem solving what can we do and started with a little bit of joint mobilization a little bit of stretching and she loves water like all ducks do so putting a bowl down and you know she started ducking into the water and then we started working I guess on I bill coordination <laughs> so she wasn't always hitting the the bottle um but then she started working on it and she's probably about 95 percent there and it's just been you know it's just been so awesome to you know to watch so been very cool i was i saw it on your facebook page and <laughs> and i think it was thursday or friday i think you guys had posted i could be wrong on my date but She's finally eating, and I was like, "Yay!" I don't. I was kind of excited for something. I had no real background too, but I was just like, "Yay!" I know it's so like, you know, oh my gosh! And I, the second time the duck came in, she came out of her little crate and she jumped on my lap and wrapped her head around my neck, Aww. and I started to panic. And the um, the owner or so the owner of the sanctuary said, "Oh, it's just a duck." duck hug <laughs> and I said oh so it's uh, been very endearing and very very awesome to do that that is cute. And, so cool well unfortunately Debbie has been called out to an emergency so we're pretty much going to just bookmark it and what's great about having Debbie on is that she will come back again and always welcome my goodness she is just a lot of fun to talk to as you guys have all been able to you know witness she is just an amazing lady with so many stories, and we had so much more to cover, which is great because we can do it again. That's what I love about doing this podcast. There's no restrictions. So with that said, I want to thank Debbie for being on the podcast. You are amazing, and I hope everything turned out just fine. And for that, I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. We'll be back, of course, next week with episode 200. Oh my God, I can't believe we're there already. Well, I'm Chris Green. Have a petastic week and Merry Christmas, everybody. Bye bye. Dashing through the snow on a one horse open sleigh. Over the field we go, laughing all the way. Bells on bobs, tails, wings, making a spirit bright. What well, fun it is to laugh and sing and sledding songs tonight. Oh, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun is to ride in one horse open sleigh. Oh, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun is to ride in one horse open sleigh. Jingle bells, Batman smells, Robin laid a name. The Batmobile lost his wheels and the Joker got away. Hey, we hope you all have a Merry Christmas. Ho, ho, ho. Twas the night before Christmas by Craig Lee.
was the night before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was soon, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care and hope that St. Nicholas will soon be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds while visions of sugar plum danced in their heads. And Mama and her kitchen and I and my cat had just settled our beds for a long winter's nap. When out on a little world, that's a clamor, I screamed from my bed to see what's the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash. Pull open a shutter and threw open the shash. The moon on the breast, on the new fallen snow, gave the luster a midday to objects below. When what to my wondering eyes stood up here but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeers. With a little old driver, so lively and quick. I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles, his courses they came. And he whistled and shouted and called them by names. Now Dasher, now Janser, now Prancer and Biskin. On Comet, on Cupid, on Donner and Blishin. To the top of the porch, to the top of the wall. Now dash away, dash away, dash away all. I drive me back before the wild hurricanes fly. When they meet with our Oscar, oh, up to the sky. Go up to the high, up to the horses they flew. With the sleigh for his toys and St. Nicholas too. When then in a twinkling, I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew in my head and were turning around down the chimney, St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was just all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes how they twinkled, his dimples how many, his cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry, his droll little mouth was drawn like a bow, and a beard on his chin as white as the snow, the stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke it encircled, and his head like a wax, he had a broad face, and a little round belly that shook when he laughed, like a bull full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a white jelly old elf. And I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his wood and filled all the stockings. Then turned with a jerk and laid his finger aside of his nose and giving a nod up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew, like a down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim, ere he drove out of sight, Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good night! Have a good day with your pet. Goodbye.